creating an environment of representation. So the fact that I'm at the league as a woman of color is very inspirational for not only women, but women of color who want to join our sport, who know that they can find a career in a place that maybe they don't have a history in because I didn't have a history in hockey and yet I can contribute. Hey everyone, welcome to Hockey Culture, the place where we're trying to change the culture of hockey one interview at a time. And today, we have a very special Stanley Cup Final Edition. I'm thrilled to be joined by NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman and Senior Executive Vice President of Social Impact, Growth Initiatives and Legislative Affairs, Kim Davis. Welcome to you both. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I want to take us back to the day when the NHL paused. And Commissioner, can you take us through that day starting with NBA postponing their playoff games? Well, what what happened was, and actually initially it wasn't the NBA postponing the games. It was the players on the Milwaukee Bucks saying they weren't going to take the court. Uh, the Orlando Magic, uh, the NBA, and the NBA Players Association didn't know anything about it. Uh, I learned about it uh, at about 5 or 5.30 with a game that was ready to start, I believe, almost within the hour. Uh, I had a brief conversation with the Players Association to understand whether or not our players wanted to not play. Uh, and if they didn't, we would be supportive. Uh, and to the best of our knowledge at the time, that wasn't something our players were focused on. Uh, but over the next uh, day, the players uh, came together and decided they thought it would be appropriate uh, to pause. And we were very supportive of that. But we had believed all along that in order for a pause to be meaningful, it really had to be at the initiative and the will of our players who wanted to make a statement as opposed to the league uh, simply saying we're going to shut down for two days. And in fact, other sports um, played. Baseball played 11 games that night. Uh, there were two games where the players decided not to play. I think the PGA Tour had a tournament the next day as well. So. I, I know there was a lot of focus on what we did or didn't do, but I was very comfortable that what we were doing was responsive to what our players wanted. And as we've been saying all along, uh, if we're going to be making a meaningful response uh, to fight racism and to support social justice, and we want our players to get involved, it's got to be all of our players across the board. That's a great point because I had a conversation with Ryan Reeves and Kevin Shattenkirk, both players who initiated uh, that pause in the play and the action, and both of those players from the East Coast and the West Coast coming together. And it took a lot of courage for current players to take that stand that are currently playing in the game and decide they're not going to play that night. And we talk about allyship. Well, here's a black athlete in Ryan Reeves, and you've got Kevin Shattenkirk, a white athlete, coming together as one deciding to do this. Um, I mean, Kim, what were the conversations you were having within the NHL community in relation to the pause and action with the players? Well, calls were coming in from every direction. Uh, we were looking at social media and the, and the pressure in many ways from fans that wanted us to take a stand. Uh, I think, uh, as Gary said, our, our approach was appropriate because if you look at the history of sports, any social movement in sport, has been led by players. And so particularly, at least in my opinion, in our sport that is predominantly white, we need allies. Uh, I was also hearing from black players, uh, players within the Hockey Diversity Alliance, uh, asking us what we were going to do. And, and I was encouraged by their action to reach out to their uh, brother players and to get them to and encourage them to be part of the movement. Uh, for this to be a movement and not just a moment, we have to have the advocacy of all players. And so to me, it was a proud moment for our sport and a watershed moment because of allyship. Well, this also led to different initiatives that the NHL just recently announced um, in partnership with the NHLPA, which is very important because the NHLPA and the NHL really agree on anything. 
but the fact that both groups yeah. came well, together would tell you how important this is to the game of hockey. And I say that well, respectfully, of course. <laughs> but well, I I actually, this came at an interesting time in terms of our relationship with the NHLPA. Uh, and, and Don Fear has ve been very proactive in working with us, whether it was the return to play initiative and what we're doing now in the protocols or the extension of the collective bargaining agreement. Th this whole movement uh, came together in a way that united the league as a whole. And I don't think it would have come down exactly the way it has and been as meaningful as it's been if we just simply said, okay, you know, league has decided we're shutting down for two days. This was really part of us working with the players and us being supportive of the players. And this was something that the players wanted to do because it was meaningful to them. Well, you've, you've nailed it, saying it's a movement, not a moment. I think just sitting out would have been just a moment. But you're trying to make this even mm -hmm. bigger and transform it into a movement. And I want to talk about some of the initiatives that you guys have talked about in the last couple of days, in particular the Executive Inclusion Council that was formed to oversee um, a lot of things that you have planned. Can you dive into this a little bit, Commissioner, and, and talk about well, who's on this council and what the plan is going forward? Um, you know, it's really Kim's creation, uh, and she's done an incredible job of, of moving us forward and raising our consciousness and pushing us very hard to make sure we're focused on doing the right things. So I'll defer to her, but the one thing I will say, the purpose of the Executive Inclusion Council is to set goals and objectives and for us to be holding ourselves accountable that we're progressing to the goals and objectives that we have. Well, Kim, uh, the, the stage is yours. There's a bunch of yeah. committees underneath the Executive Inclusion Council that I'm a part of. I'm very fortunate and honored to be a co-chair of the Players Inclusion Committee. But can you talk about the different committees that are subcommittees underneath the Executive Inclusion Council and exactly uh, what the responsibilities will be going forward? I'm happy to, and I think it's important as we set the stage for this work to understand that, as Gary said, this is work that we've been undertaking for all, over a year. Uh, four things like the kind of culture change that we're talking about to indeed, again, be a movement and not a moment. You have to put the right kind of architecture in place that creates this to be part of the DNA of our sport. And so the first part of that is leadership. And so the council and the committees are part of our leadership, beginning with the Executive Inclusion Council, which is made up of owners, presidents, general managers, and executives of the clubs. And the idea here, as Gary said, is for this group to be setting goals and objectives and to hold not only the league, but our entire sport accountable to hitting certain guideposts and for us to really change our sport so that it is indeed welcoming and more inclusive across the board. Supporting that effort are three very, very important committees. The Player Inclusion Committee, which you just indicated, Anson, we're excited to have both you and P.K. Subban as the co-chairs. The Fan Inclusion Council, which is the voice of our marketing folks, uh, folks in the, in the broadcasting community, and others who are helping us become more culturally available to new audiences and the Youth Inclusion Council, which is a critically important element made up of parents, made up of young people, made up of coaches, and others in the youth hockey ecosystem to help ensure that up and down the hockey spine, our sport is welcoming and inclusive. These three committees will provide input and will really be the voice of the customer in many ways, fans, youth, and the broader player uh, population so that the Executive Inclusion Council can take action and that we can have consistency across our entire league as we think about the future. Kim, I thought it was very important too that you didn't rush to put these committees and councils out there. You took your time. Remember when you were first hired by the National Hockey League, you had me speak to Spike Lee's group and just to do like a Q&A to, to kind of talk about the culture of hockey and I th what I thought the challenges might be. And they'd be talking to other minorities in the game of hockey to discuss the challenges they thought the hockey presented to them. And if you just rush the judgment right away and put these committees and councils out there, I don't think it would have been thoughtful. It wouldn't have been considerate because it's a big task at hand because you have to understand all the data. Now, we talk about exactly. data as an important thing. Um, I thought it was critical for you guys to understand the data. And some of the data that you shared with me, I understand that now we have over 400,000 kids here in the U.S. playing hockey under the age of 18. 
You know, 16.9% of them are females. Under 5% of them are minorities. And this is all data that's just been collected recently from USA Hockey. Like, how important is having that and be able to use those metrics to plan, to have a game plan going forward? Well, well it's critical you have- because Gary often says, and I agree, that you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been and where you are. And so having a baseline of understanding and to be led by data and analytics, I think, is the way we run our business. And this is part of running our business well. This data gathering has also allowed us to be very intentional about identifying what we're now calling six areas of collaboration that we will focus on. We talked about leadership, which is the councils and committees, education, which is how do we build cultural competency across our entire league and clubs, employment and demographic, how do we go through the assessment process of understanding where we are relative to demographics so that we can know how we can go out and recruit and hire uh, a more multicultural uh, uh, population, partnerships, participation. We've been strong on the participation side on the youth level, but we can do more and we can do better. And then community and civic engagement, which has been a long-standing strength of ours, but being far more transparent and vocal about the things that we have done and the things that we will do to ensure that our game continues to be strong and that we build stronger, more vibrant communities. And Anson, let me, let me just add to that because in addition to focusing on all of the objectives that that Kim has laid out, we at the league office and at our clubs have to make sure that we're doing the right things and that we're welcoming and inclusive at the NHL level. And that means training and education. That means having a hotline. That means not tolerating bad conduct. Uh, And we, if we're going to make a difference through all the levels of our game, we have to be setting the example uh, at the NHL and club level, and that relates to hiring uh, and who we do business with. And that's all part of our broad program to set the right example for the entire hockey community at all levels. Well, speaking of hiring, I've, Seattle's coming in the league to join us as an expansion franchise. They've done a terrific job uh, bringing a diverse group of people in to help run that organization. Um, How excited are you about seeing a team like Seattle coming, not just talking the talk, but they're walking the walk? Well, uh, Todd Laiwicki, uh, obviously, who's the CEO, and David Bonderman, who's the principal owner, have made it a priority to make sure that they're creating a vibrant, diverse organization. Diversity brings you strength. And when you're starting from scratch and you have the right values and you have the right goals and objectives, you can really make a difference and be very reflective of your community. Uh, And every step of the way, they've been doing the right things in a first class way. So we're really excited to, to have Seattle coming into the league and setting a good example. Kim, a big goal of yours, too, is not only diversifying the game on the ice, but off the ice, like talking about Seattle as an organization with also the NHL front offices. Can you talk about some of the recent hires that you've had of people that you've brought in to your group to help you achieve your goals? Yeah, and, and again, let me applaud Seattle. One of the things that I have enjoyed uh, working with Todd around is, you know, he wanted to understand where, where we had been and how had we made either, you know, great hires or things that we could have done better so that they wouldn't have to step into some of the same areas that other clubs maybe had not been as effective in. And so he has taken that organization from strength to strength because he's built on the past for the future. I had the opportunity to hire um, a number of positions in my group, and I went for top talent. And I think when we think about talent as top talent and we don't look at it in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, I think we get the best and the brightest. And part of that is also creating an environment of representation. So the fact that I'm at the league as a woman of color is very inspirational for not only women, but women of color who want to join our sport, who know that they can find a career in a place that maybe they don't have a history in because I didn't have a history in hockey and yet I can contribute. So I think this is yet another way for us to demonstrate how we can grow our sport by bringing in top talent of all backgrounds. You went to the prestigious Spelman School in Atlanta, where I live. And uh, do you see NHL teams now looking to non-traditional universities and colleges like HBCUs to try to find talent to populate the front offices with? 
I absolutely do. First of all, you probably know that um, Howard University, which like Spelman is a historically black college and university, um, has been asking for the past couple of years to start a hockey team down there. Um, and they've been working with USA Hockey on establishing a hockey team. So I think not only is it a place for top talent, uh, but I think it's also a place where uh, people who love the sport, who come from underrepresented backgrounds can thrive. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's, that's part of what is going to continue to make our sport exciting for groups that maybe historically haven't been part of it. I think Spelman is an amazing platform to, uh, uh, to attract talent. Uh, for the Hockey League, and I'm going to make sure that we, we bring some talent uh, ultimately from Spelman to the NHL. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of buy-in at the NHL level. How important is it at the team level for the teams to buy-in also? Because it could be very easy for the team to say, well, we'll let the league just handle this. We're going to do our own thing. Are you guys going to be hands-on with making sure the league, I mean, the teams are following lockstep into what you guys are putting forward? Uh, absolutely. The clubs at the ownership level, uh, are incredibly supportive of what we're doing and the goals and objectives. Uh, and they are viewing Kim and the people that she's brought in to work with her as an incredible resource uh, to expand their consciousness and give them uh, a, an opportunity to do things that they've never focused on before or haven't focused on enough. And so I think the, the bench strength that we now have with Kim and her team uh, and the accessibility our team, our teams in general have to her and her group uh, is going to move us along even faster. And Kim, not just the team level, but also the grassroots level with USA Hockey and Hockey Canada, uh, how important is it to have zero tolerance? Because I believe if a mm -hmm. child in minor hockey encounters something that's negative, you can give that child another chance. Mm -hmm. But with parents, I believe it's zero tolerance. Uh, where do you stand on that situation if that was to be presented to you? Um, if a child says, well, Kim, this happened to me in a minor hockey game or a practice where a parent comes to you, what would you say to USA Hockey? Or what would you say to Hockey Canada uh, to discipline these parents or these kids? Zero tolerance. And Gary has been clear about that. Uh, he has made that known to leadership uh, at USA Hockey and, and in all areas of, of the sport. Uh, you, you, I think you know USA Hockey put a rule in place last fall of zero tolerance, and we just have to make sure that at every level, at every affiliate level, that that rule is being adhered to and that, you know, through training and development, clearly we want to make sure people understand. But once we've gone through the process of ensuring that they understand, then there have to be penalties for, for them not, be, not behaving appropriately. No child should ever feel like they are called an, an inappropriate word, a discriminatory, a discriminatory word uh, in our sport. That is what I think we stand for. When, when I get letters from parents who talk about an incident for their five or six or seven year old as a father and a grandfather, it makes me crazy because a child shouldn't be traumatized no matter what the background because they want to play hockey and, and yes, Zero tolerance and will punish, but what we've made clear to the organizations that we work with is it's got to stop, and education is going to be a key component of that, but it cannot be tolerated. Yeah. Let's, let's look out five years, and I want to ask you both, looking at the hockey landscape in five years, what does progress look like to both of you? Commissioner Bettman. To me, to, to me progress looks like uh, that we become more reflective of the communities in which our teams play, that there are more black players of both sexes, players of color of both sexes, and that we are more diverse than we've been. I can't quantify the numbers because, as Kim said, we got to know where we're starting from exactly so we can set goals and objectives. But I want to make sure that anybody feels comfortable and welcome playing hockey or being part of the hockey family at any level of our game. Yeah, five years is a perfect benchmark from my perspective because my daughter had a son two and a half weeks ago and I now am thinking about all of this through the lens of my grandson. And, you know, five years from now, I want hockey to be on the lips of, of, of boys and girls of color just the way 
you know, soccer and basketball and baseball is on their lips. Something that they see as accessible and something that they see as something that they want to do. That we have ball and street hockey in communities around North America. That we are connected, even more connected than we are today globally to hockey. That in fact, we no longer have to worry about racist comments and kids not feeling that they can take advantage of hockey without some incident of discrimination. That, that is our vision. That is my personal vision uh, as, a, as a mother, as a grandmother, uh, as a black woman for the sport of hockey, that everyone feels like this is a sport for them. So, Kim, in five years, I'll have a pair of ice skates ready for your grandson, so I better <laughs> see him out there on the ice twirling around. I'm ready. He's ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you mentioned something about leadership uh, earlier in our conversation, and then it's touched a memory when I live in Atlanta. I keep saying that, and it's a big military area. There's a lot of bases there, and a lot of my friends in the military, and they talk about people get into the military to learn leadership, and people keep talking about leadership and becoming fierce leaders. Well, the biggest thing, the biggest characteristic a lot of my friends told me about being in the military and the Army is you learn how to follow. That's just as important as being a leader. And coming together with the leadership that we have here in hockey with Commissioner Bettman, yourself, Kim Davis, Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly, uh, Executive Director of Don Fear, the NHLPA, Matthew Schneider. Uh, I think the leadership is solid, but it's about following now. And in, in terms of following, it's about teamwork. And it's about working together. We can't do this as individuals. We have to do this as a team, as a group of individuals that come together and make this stronger. So I want to thank both of you for your hard work. And I'm looking forward to putting in the work in the very near future to try to make hockey a safer place to play and be, and be a great fan too. Well, Thanks thank so you, much. Anson. And we appreciate everything that you're doing to support these efforts. Well, you're welcome on Hockey Culture anytime. Thank you again both. Thanks a lot, Anson. Always enjoy talking with you.